Thanks for inviting my wife and I to contribute to the centennial celebration for Durgan on Sinha. Anita is open swimming this morning with a group of other women in the Pacific Ocean, but she sends her very warm regards. We met Professor Sinha in 1978 when we came to Allahabad University from the University of Michigan on fellowships. Anita and I recall the Sinha's hospitality right from the get-go, and Professor Sinha's warmth, his charm, his intellect, and diplomacy. We admired how he used humor, often with a gentle sprinkling of irony, to introduce us to a new way of thinking about something, or to offer a new perspective for our consideration always a great mentor. I like to think of Professor Sinha's vision of psychology as a tapestry of the world, a world map. Instead of political boundaries, it would show cultural ones. An annoying thing about this tapestry would be that um, whether it made sense depended on which culture was looking at it. Furthermore, it made sense to scientists in some cultures more than it did to scientists in other cultures. What a strange map. And I think that's the one that Professor Sinha figuratively saw. If science was to be universal, it needed to learn more about its cultures. Unless that learning took place, no one, not you or I, could be sure that we were observing without cultural distortion through our own lenses. You might be seeing what's in our mind's eye as much as what's out there. Without delay, Professor Sinha got to work, drawn large, on stimulating in India and internationally the capacity to address this problem. He saw the job as building an Indian social and behavioral science, right from its points of origin, not from the West, of developing a science that was open to concepts and approaches known to those who were being studied, but yet to be appreciated by the researcher, and of creating exchanges and collaborations among scientists from all cultures to address the issue of cultural distortion. If you're thinking about stakeholders, everybody has a stake in this problem. Anita and I were able to come to Allahabad and Allahabad scholars were able to visit our university and other universities, partly because of the significant role Durganan Sinha played in supporting professional collaboration between nations. Anita and I have fond memories of hosting Professors Tripathi, Naidu, and Dalal. Professor Janak Pandey established an impressive sequence of collaborations with North American investigators. Professor Sinha put as much effort into supporting India's contributions to its own social science as it did to the world's. As a result of his advocacy and support, I know, being a Western psychologist, that we began to read about and explore concepts new to our culture, such as Hindu and Islamic notions of fate and destiny, ones that got missed in the Western mindset, except as shaky justification for imperialism manifest destiny, the fate of the world in our hands. His enthusiasm for what lay at the frontiers of Indian social science attracted top quality people to the psychology department, which he founded. That was the beginning. Many students that Anita and I knew during our stays have become teachers and professors in their own right they form generation two 
in Professor Sinha's legacy. Scholars and creative teachers such as Rashmi Kumar, Namita Pandey, Raghu Sinha, Anup Singh, Nisha Dawan, and Rajiv Sharma. In their hands, Generation 3 ensures the continuation of Sinha's legacy. Students become scholars, and scholars create more students. Of course, the names I mentioned are only a sampling, an illustration, and to all the others, warm hellos. For better and worse, Professor Sinha lived under the occupation of another culture, the British. But I never had that experience. As a result, I think Professor Sinha better understood what my culture failed to understand. He understood that we are just learning, or he understood what we were just learning, that cultural ignorance can undermine the scientific process of hypothesizing, observing, and drawing conclusions. Culture in, hypotheses, observations, drawing conclusions out not that objective. In America, respecting one another's cultures has not been a strength in our country. I'd like to focus by example on one area where that situation is changing. The awareness of how the history of land differs between Americans indig America's indigenous peoples and the rest of us. Try this. As part of the American Dictionary of Words, I propose that we define the difference between indigenous people and the rest of Americans as follows. Indigenous people are those whose land was taken from them. The rest of us Americans I'll define as those who use that land. Were Professor Sinha here today, he would have found much to talk about on this topic with America's indigenous peoples. These days, the people from the Hopis, the Cheyenne, the Sioux, and many other tribes have produced university educated scholars and tribally held research institutions. Check out the web. Their work is open to the world. I imagine they have read Professor Sinha's seminal work on indigenously focused research and found it supportive of their scholarly and practical data-informed goals. Were he visiting, I could imagine tribal faculty and students engage with that visiting Professor Sinha in trying to identify where next in research design measurement and substantive issues should we be going. I'd like to end by going back to the divide between those who have unjustly lost land and those who occupy it. I'd like to follow a practice increasingly, though still rarely used in our country, to recognize that we are not this land's first peoples. In appreciation and memory of Durganan Sinha and his highlighting the role of culture as a cause as well as an object of science. I hereby acknowledge that I am living on land that was originally lived on by the indigenous people known as the Tongva. I acknowledge that the Tongva were removed from this land in violation of their time-honored and tested rules, beliefs, and values. I acknowledge that this removal was carried out by rules that were not their own and by disease that was not their own. If the region that was taken from the Tongva, essentially Los Angeles County, was a country, it would have been the sixth, it would be today, the 16th largest economy in the world. Its economy would equal the combined gross domestic product of Sweden, Argentina, Belgium, and Saudi Arabia combined. Current value, an estimated $707 billion. 
if Professor Sinha were here today, he might gently say, Bob, I suppose $707 billion is how Westerners communicate the value of what was lost. But I wonder what scales the Tongva would use. I'd nod my head and say, so you're thinking? And he'd say, We'd want to ask them, of course, if their lives and culture was anything like our first peoples in India. I'm guessing the costs that they would like to include would go beyond dollars and rupees, that the costs that they would like to include might be loss of quality of life due to air and water pollution, the loss of species diversity, the loss of food and life due to climate change, the loss of mental health due to inability to live in harmony with nature, and so on. To which I would have said, people say all of us on this planet need to use those measures, Professor. Who would have thought that we might learn as much from recognizing the wisdom of the indigenous. Thank you for inviting my comments. Best wishes on the centennial and on your future teaching and research. Bye-bye. Oh